discuss the ultimate life abroad, living like a local, launching my wine business in Cape Town, and helping locals start businesses. All this while drinking wine in a foreign country. Zuri Wine Tasting presents Wine and Dine Nights, featuring African-American winemakers, live music, and a four-course dinner prepared by Chef John Cleveland of Post and Beans. That's right, you grab the forks and we'll pop the corks. Join Zuri Wine Tasting for our Meet the Maker dinner party series featuring wines made by African-Americans. Zuri Wine Tasting is partnering with Post and Beans to create a delicious four-course dinner and wine pairing experience. The evening starts with live music and a sparkling wine reception. Each wine dinner is hosted by a unique winemaker of color. The food and the wine pairing are beautifully curated by Post and Beans chef John Cleveland and the owner of Zuri Wine Tasting, Twenty Price. This is your chance to meet amazing winemakers and enjoy a delicious four-course meal. The experience includes dinner, wine pairing, and live music. Featured wine brands are Moreno Sparkling Wines, Flow Wines by Marcus Johnson, Charles Wine Company, Richaro Wines, and P. Harrell Wines. Get your ticket. We can't wait to see you. Hi, everyone. It's 20 Price of Zuri Wine Tasting and a Broad Drinking Wine, and I am here with Tara. She is the winemaker of Kita Wines, and what makes Tara so amazing, so special, is she is Native American, and her tribe, the Chumash tribe, um, based in, um, was it Central Valley, California? Is Central it Coast. Central Coast, California. Oh, they, Santa, Inez, Santa Inez Valley. Santa Inez Valley. Yeah. They own Kita Wines, and I don't know if there's any more Native American winemakers our wineries yes uh not that i know of in terms of winemakers um but there are a few native american wineries um, and they have vineyards uh, but i think what separates us from the rest is that we have uh, one from within our own tribe uh, making the wines for the tribe uh, versus the others who have consultants that they bring in to, to make the wines. the wines for them. I love it. So thank you so much. Tara, right? Am Tara. I, Tara. I, could, I was like, is it Tara? Is it Tara? So is it T-E-R-A or T? It's T-A-R-A. T -A -R -A. T oh, but you pronounce but it Tara. Tara. Yes. Tara. So thank you so much for having us here. Um, so we are in the tasting room. We are in Lompong. Yeah. Are we, we're going to taste, right? I mean, yes, please. <laughs> Let's taste. I want to hear your story about like how you got started and like what's your passion? Like what's what's your what's your deal? Uh, well, uh, I got into the wine industry. Um, what what kind of started it all was the love of science. So a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of science, um, a lot of chemistry that goes into winemaking, and so that's kind of like what sparked the interest. Um, and then from there, it just grew. Uh, my parents used to go wine tasting a lot. And so when we were younger as kids, we used to go on the wine tours. And uh, it was just walking into the cellar, seeing, the, as a child, seeing these super big, large stainless steel vats. And then just the smell of it. Uh, oh, yeah. Fermentation. I do love going the smell. On. I smell it, it right now. It was just so unique in its own way. And it just kind of, like, caught my attention. And so... Um, you know, on the wine tours, going and passing by the lab, that was the instant connection right there, was being able to see them actually doing titrations, which is the chemistry, which is what kind of I really loved to do back when I was a child. I know, it's kind of weird. <laughs> I mean, like I, I had You're like the bad scientist <laughs> as a child. I like had my first chemistry set, uh, my first Fisher Price microscope when I was four. Oh, wow. Oh, so way and, back when. Way back when. But then from there, it just grew. Nice. So, yeah. Um, and then uh, I knew in high school that that was the direction I wanted to go. And uh, yeah, I mean, from there, I went off to college, Fresno State, graduated out of the knowledge program, and then went to work. <laughs> yeah, and you made wines for J. Lore Wines, which everybody loves J. Lore Wines. Like, yeah, yes. Parker, J. Lore, I did two harvests in Spain. 
uh, and then um, came back, and that was when the tribe purchased the property, the Camp 4 property. I love it. So, yeah, in 2010. This is Alice. Okay, so hey, Alice. Uh -huh. This is Tara. She's the wine maker. This is Camille. And so, um, when they purchased the property, though, did they purchase it with you in mind, or did they pur did, did it just so happen that they purchased the property and then you were like, okay, cool, that's where I want to go work, or did it happen simultaneously? No, actually, the the whole reason why they purchased the property uh, was uh, to build housing. Mm -hmm. So that that was primary. Uh, and then secondary, of course, was already having an established vineyard. And so um, it took some convincing. But uh, yeah, they gave me the opportunity to start making wine for them. Um, so it was like a test. <laughs> I love it. I, I had three tons to play around with. And um, so I chose a, a Grenache, a Syrah, and a Cabernet. So one ton each. Wow, so two that are very well known in this valley and grow super well. And then the Cab, I mean, I guess you can go, grow Cab anywhere, right? Not anywhere. I mean, you need to have warmer climates for cat. I mean, the Bordeaux um, definitely need warmer um, climates for. And um, so, yeah, it was actually because um, I came from Paso Robles, um, wine country and um, cab country. I mean, it's all Cabernet Sauvignon and Zinfandel. They're Bordeaux. But they told me that to go back to Paso because you can't make a Cabernet Sauvignon here. In the right. And. I guess that may have been a challenge, and so um, yeah, I wanted to make it. <laughs> I love it. And, so what are we what are we drinking so, right so now? So this is Taya. This is the first wine. Taya. Taya means uh, abalone shell in our native Somala language. Oh, it's a blend of Marsan, Rusan, Grenache Blanc. Marsan, Rusan, and Grenache. So it's Rome varietals, and it means what kind of shell? Uh, abalone um, shell and so um, how I came about that name is uh, when I was writing the tasty notes um, reminded me so much of of the ocean um, you kind of get that minerality that salinity in it uh, and so um, I just was trying to I mean there's that trying to find um, a story for each of the blends because I only make three blends and so the story is, is that it's based on the natural elements of life so this represents water Taya. I love it I'm a water sign so that's special to my heart <laughs> so it is delicious so to be honest I've tasted Lompoc wines but I've never tasted in Lompoc so this is my first time tasting in Lompoc Oh, wow, okay. And what I didn't realize was that Lompoc was closer to the ocean mm -hmm. than some other regions. Right, and so that's where Lompoc kind of thrives in the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir um, varietals. And, and then, even in this varietal, yeah. I do get that seashell. I get that, um, it's not crisp like a Sauvignon Blanc, but it has this like edge to mm -hmm. it you know yeah it has that it has a little bit of creaminess to it mm -hmm. you get those citrus uh aspects to it um i think of a seashell that's kind of like you know like when you crack it and it's kind of dusty mm -hmm. um but then it's still from the ocean so you kind of get that saltiness too yeah yeah that's what it reminds me of hey. <laughs> how do you guys like it <laughs> you know, I always, I always, um, every time I think of this wine, I always think of of seafood. You know, mm -hmm. pairing it with seafood, it, it goes great with any shelled fish, any um, fish in general. <laughs> yeah, it would be great with yeah. some, even some oysters. Oysters, yes. Um, now, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like it though because it still has a lot of body, but like sometimes when I have Roussons, they can have too much body, like they could be too creaminess, you know? But this yeah, is very light. Creamy. Right. And, and Roussons tends to have, um, you know, like a little bit of that nuttiness, that mm -hmm. breadiness. Um, bread, not bread. <laughs> and, um, 
and this does it. So I pick it a little early, and, and that's why I have predominantly Marsan as the base of it, which you don't really see too often. Mm -mm. You don't really see Marsan-based blends. Um, so, so for our vineyard, uh, Marsan, um, you know, has some really good structure and body, but what it doesn't have is the aromatics. Um, and so that's where Roussan and Grenache Blanc kind of play in. You kind of get that white floral from the Grenache Blanc, um, and you get a, a little bit of that oily character. That's the Roussan uh, as well, and um, that gives it the body. And then Marsan is just the backbone of it all. Nice. I like that a lot. And camphor, so camphor, when you think about Lompoc, it's in Lompoc, right? Mm -hmm. And where is it? Oh, no, it? camphor is in Serenis Valley. Um, so we're about 45 minutes from Camp Four Vineyard. Okay. Um, so the, the eastern edge of the San Is Valley. Okay. Um, and we're on the western edge. Right um, now. Right now. Okay. Uh, here in Lompoc. I mean, we're only 10 minutes away from the ocean. Nice. So, and so that's where, so as I mentioned, um, um, the Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, um, you see Cool Climate Syrahs, um, you see Gruner Veltliner, um, that's an interesting and, one. Yeah, I actually, I, I make that for uh, my own label that I have, um, which is called Camines to Dreams. And so we, we focus, my wife and I focus here in Santa Rita Hills um, on Cool Climate Syrahs mm -hmm. and Gruner. Now, is your wife, is she also a winemaker? She is, yes. So nice. You can hear the forklift on the other side. Don't go <laughs> <That's here. okay. laughs> I mean, I definitely, if we have time, I definitely would just like to take a quick, oh, like, yeah, sure. just, just sure. drive by through the yeah. cellar just to see what's oh, going nice. on in there. I know you don't have a lot of time because yeah. you have to get ready for picking. I know tomorrow's my last day um, of, of bringing fruit in for Kita. Uh -huh. um, so I'll be bringing in the rest of the Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Syrah, and Grenache. Do you feel like the harvest season this year is happening a lot later than before? Or do you think like it's catching up to be normal and before we've just picked early? Yeah. Like, second, at, second remark that you said, yes, I, I think it's coming back to be normal. Okay. And we were just picking earlier. For some reason, though, it's always around Labor Day weekend. We get that heat spike mm -hmm. um, that kind of pushes everything forward. And so that's exactly what happened to us again this year. Um, but then it cooled back down right after. So a lot and of so, reds are still on the vine, though. Like, oh, yeah. And it's, there's still probably about maybe 60% still left on the vine for us over at Cap 4. Um, and so, um, so yeah, my it was really interesting because Grenache was the first varietal that we ended up picking um, this year, which is generally a mid-season ripener. And for it to be first, like... And uh, it kind of had me scratching my head because I wasn't expecting it. That's the cool uh, thing about wine, though, because sometimes <laughs> things can happen and you're kind of like, well, I can't really explain it, but I'm going to go with it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm just so, so lucky in the sense that I sampled everything <laughs> like early on to see where everything was just to kind of give me like a baseline. And yeah, Grenache was was up there. I was. Wow. Like, and really shocked. <laughs> so when you sample it, are you just going through the vines and, like, picking, like, clusters? So I pick clusters, You yes. pick clusters? On, on both sides of the vine and in the middle, on the front, in the back. And are you just tasting side? the grapes or are you doing no, something no, else no. to them? No, I'm, I'm picking them and then I bring it to the winery. I crush it. I let it. I, I pretty much do what I do. So you make, I like, mimic, a mini. I mimic what I do. Um in the winery for real. <laughs> I love it. So, so to really give me like, um, so I let it macerate even for like, I don't know, half an hour or whatever. And, um, you know, with the skins and everything. And, and then I strain it out, press it and, and let the juice sample kind of settle out um, from all the sediment. And then I run my chemistry on it. Nice. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about after I get that rosé in yes. my glass. <laughs> so Next this is one is our 2018 Grenache rosé. It's such a beautiful color. Now, I pick my rosés based on the color. Like, I like mine's like salmon, pinkish, a little bit of orange to them. Um, I don't like them too, like, dark and red. Um, yeah, this I is like definitely it. more of a salmon-looking um, yeah. color. Um, so we pick our our rosé specifically for the rosé program, meaning that 
Um, it's not Saunier, it's 100% um, Grenache grapes that we pick. Um, we bring it into the winery, we foot stomp it. <laughs> nice. Um, Do you have any we can foot stomp today? I don't know. We, well, I probably will tomorrow, but uh, yeah, not today. <laughs> a day, a day <laughs> early. <laughs> um, and so um, you let it macerate in the press for hours. I mean, I'm talking, it's, it's the longest day um, of, of, you know, that the fruit that we bring in, this takes us the longest amount of time because we let it macerate um, for so long. I'm talking like 10 hours. Wow. Um, and but I think that that's key because a lot of people always want to know, well, how long do you leave it on the skins to get a rosé? Is it is it two hours? Is it 10 hours? Is it two days? Mm -hmm. So basically 10 hours, right? 10 around, hours? Around, around 10 hours. Around I mean, 10 each, hours on the skin. Each year kind of varies. Um, but yeah, I pick it early, around 21, 22 bricks, um, and yeah, I mean, the, the um, color is not quite developed yet, which is why I need to let it macerate for a longer period of time, uh, and then I begin the press, which is like a three-hour cycle, so, um, and then it starts going through its motions and pressing and so in layman's terms, just for the people out there who are not like wine people, like you and I, so basically you pick them before they're super, super ripe. Yes, of So course. you yes. pick them before they're super ripe. So that's, so that's how you end up with such freshness. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, here you get like strawberry, you get like watermelon. I was going to say that. Um, like as soon as I tasted it, I tasted yeah. like this fresh watermelon and like... Um, it's so light on the tongue. It has like this really light body, which I love in a rosé. But it still has like that so depth of flavor. Though, yeah. So I've noticed with your wines, the first two that we've tasted so far, they're very um, light in style, um, romantic, clean. They're delicious. Um, is that the style? Would you say in general that's your style of winemaking? Yeah, I try to really focus on uh, food-friendly wines, so I'm not making um, really big and um, you know high alcohol wines mm -hmm. um, because to me that's harder to pair uh, with food. I mean, you need something really hearty to pair with with the wine, and and then you know at the end of a glass you, you feel somewhat tired and. Uh, you can really feel the alcohol, <laughs> and so and so. This is meant to to really enjoy, um, and um, it allows you to pair with just about anything. Yeah, I so, like it. And really, just the focus is on the freshness. Um, you get the freshness, you get the brightness, um, and you, and you get some really nice structure as well. Um, so a mixture of all three, and it's really just trying to find that balance. Speaking of balance. Can you just talk a little bit about like your experience in the wine industry, being a woman, being Native American, um, talk about like expectations that people might have, or perceptions, or challenges maybe? Sure. I mean, well, well for me, balance kind of comes natural. Um, just um, growing up, um, you know, in, in our culture, um, you know, we're, we're always... Um, in search of our balance, of trying to find that balance, and so um, the balance of ourselves and our surroundings, um, and so in winemaking, it, it's pretty similar, um, you know. In, in um, you know the the grapes, it, it's a balance of, of not only the sugar level, but the acidity, um, the flavor profile, the color, um, the structure of the juice, and so um, I mean those are determining factors, um, and then of course the taste of, of of it, um, so it's not it's not just based on one thing. It's like several things. So you're um, infusing your Native American culture into the winemaking process. Yes, I love I it. Was, I would say that, and and I don't know. I just feel like um, I'm in my element when I'm out there in the vineyard. Um, just finding that connection, that connection to the land, that connection to the vineyards, to the grapes, um, and and so that's how Kita got its name. So um, Kita means our valley oak. In our native Samoan language, and if you look at um, you know the picture here of, of the vineyard and, and all the oak trees um, out in the vineyard, um, several of them, and a lot of them being valley oak leaf, oak trees, and so so that's the symbol um, of our of our label. It's a valley oak leaf, 
and just trying to find that connection to the land and connecting that to the vineyard and to the winery. Nice. But what about socially? Socially, are there any challenges? Of course. Like I mean, this is a male-dominated this is a male dominated industry. It's a man's world. <laughs> not going to lie. <laughs> and, um, but what's interesting is that you're starting to see more and more women mm-hmm. venturing out into the wine industry. But but when I first started, yeah, it was only um, when I graduated from college, there was only two women that graduated. In your class? Out of, out of wow. ten. And so... Um, and then, yes, working with all my male counterparts. Um, uh, but now in the younger generations, you're starting to see more and more um, women getting into the wine industry. So, and being leaders in the wine industry. Like, well. I got your contact information from Iris Rideau. Oh, yeah. And she mm-hmm. owned Rideau Vineyards, and she had a female winemaker mm-hmm. who was tough, who was, like, badass, right? right? I yes. mean, I think she's still there. She is. But I just love that there's so many powerful women in this industry who are, like, just making shit happen, you know? Yeah, no, of course. And, and um, I mean, we have our own group of of you know women winemakers that we we get together every now and then we should be getting together more often but we don't because we're all busy and we all have have things going on but but we do get together to support each other and just the other night um lane tanner um uh was recently nominated um from wine enthusiast as winemaker of the year nice and so about six seven of us got together women winemakers got together to go and show our support even though we're busy and we're in the middle of harvest it's just great to see um you know woman empowerment that gives me chills (laughs) they're supporting each other you know we're we're um you know dressed like like you know here for for work winemaking but then everybody gets all like dolled up dressed up um to go there and and you know change of clothes and and it's nice every now and then to be able to to get dressed up and be able to go so yeah i mean i feel like it's great to be like a really hard winemaker working like i've worked harvest i worked harvest in south africa and harvest is no joke I was going to have a film crew come out to, um, we were looking for somewhere to do Harvest. And so she was like, well, you need a change of outfits and you should wear this. You should wear your cowboy boots and a nice dress. I said, if oh, I walk into a cellar with some cowboy boots yeah. and a nice dress. Don't laugh at me. Yeah. I need some work boots. If I don't have yeah. work boots, some sturdy tennis shoes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's, there's literally nothing glamorous about working in a cellar and that's like working harvest was when I was like oh no I don't want to be a winemaker (laughs) I mean I love it and it's fun to do like every once in a while like if somebody's like hey can you come help out temporarily but like it's a lot of work it is it it, it is I mean and so that's that's where I say it, it has to be a passion that you have because uh, to work as many hours as you do seven mm-hmm. days a week. I mean, for me, I'm pulling a minimum of 15 hours a day. And, and you're cleaning mo- and what people don't realize yeah. is you're cleaning <laughs> 80, most of the time. 80%, 80% you're doing janitorial work, and yes. sanitizing, cleaning the, cleaning there's, the barrels. There's cleaning no the cleaning bins. crew that comes out. <laughs> no, no. Like, cleaning you know, the floors. You work in accounting, you work all day. There's somebody who comes yeah. at night and cleans your office. Yeah. Like, when you're a winemaker, you're yeah, cleaning you're your own all. office. You're doing it all. And, um, I mean, for me, like, like it's just me and and my wife, Maria, she comes and helps me too during harvest time. But it's, it's yeah, it's just, I'm the only one. Wow. <laughs> and, and then I have a tasting room manager and I have a sales, um, a sales assistant who helps me, sales and office assistant, who helps me in, you know, with all the paperwork and everything. But that's it. Um, so. That's, and that's the thing too. That's the team. <laughs> yeah. And so like that's a lot when you think about it so now you're talking about like the whole entrepreneurship of it all right Mm -hmm. because like making the wine is your passion and doing that is no problem right Right. but when somebody's like oh now you got to reconcile the books Mm -hmm. or you got to do some marketing it's like no that's that's not my passion the whole marketing (laughs) the whole marketing aspect of it is a whole nother yeah it's a beast side to it and so having to go out there and, and work the market and try and sell the wines i mean yeah, they don't really teach you that <laughs> much in in college. Like, like and you're like, like, yeah, I want to be a winemaker. I want to be a winemaker. And then I didn't know this other side of it. Like, wait a minute, it's so easy to make the wine, but now you have to go out and sell it. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, I did my job. I make good wine. <laughs> I, I love it. Here, so 
Grenache. Yay! So this was um, a new release um, from 2012 vintage was the last time we actually made this uh, made this wine. And so it's a comeback from 2012, um, so 2017 Grenache. So you guys took a break. Did something happen? Hi. Hi. Did something happen with the vines? So this is, this is Brittany, our tasting room manager. Hi, Hi Brittany. <laughs> Thanks for letting us take over before you guys open up. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm usually not the type of person, like, I mean, of course, I love all wines, right? But my go-to mm -hmm. is red wines. But those literally, I'm not even just saying this to say it. Like, I literally could sit down and have a glass of wine, have a glass of that white, and just talk and enjoy life and, mm -hmm. and just enjoy the wine. Mm -hmm. Whereas usually with white, I'm like, okay, I will have white when I'm having food for the most part, not just to have it by itself. But both of those were very drinkable just by themselves. Right. So yes, this is our 2017 Grenache. Um, so you get a lot of floral attributes here. Um, more like rose petal and violet and a little bit of hibiscus as well. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Pomegranate. <laughs> yes, and that too. Yeah, the color is, is really light, hence the, the Grenache Rosé being as light as it is. Um, so that's the red version of this. Um, um, wow. Like I, like, I don't add anything to it. I mean, I don't fill it in with other varietals because I do that in the blends, and it's only the three blends that I make. So everything else is 100% varietal. Um, uh, like the Sauvignon Blanc is 100%, so this Grenache is 100%. Grenache is 100%. Uh, Cabernet, Sauvignon, Cabernet Sauvignon is 100%. Um, and so the thought was, it's like, wow, it's really light. Like, it, it's, I, I didn't, but I didn't want to do anything to it because I didn't want to compromise um, the attributes of Grenache itself. Right, and um, it's, you so I could have added like a little bit of though. Syrah to it to to help it with color, but then I'm compromising the rest of of you know, the, the, the beauty of this bridal. No, honestly, I think it is absolutely a beautiful wine. I wouldn't have changed anything about it. Mm -hmm. And it says so much, like, it has this little bit of acidic, like, aftertaste. And then even after you taste all the pomegranates and these really fruit flavors, I even have, like, a little bit of a chocolate, like a light yeah, you get, chocolate mm -hmm. on the finish. Right. A little bit of chalky, dusty tannins. Yep, but the tannins, tannins are like really round and mm -hmm. well and soft integrated. and velvety. So. That was delicious. <laughs> that was just like the man that I want in my life. <laughs> Beautiful, refined, <laughs> well a little well-rounded, well -rounded. Well -rounded. <laughs> with a little bit of sassiness to him though. Just a little bit though, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, so, this, so these are the blends. Um, so, so Taya is what we just had here. So this was the blend of Marsan, Roussan, Grenache Blanc. That was the first one we had in our glass, okay. mm -hmm. um, the first wine. Um, and, and so as I mentioned, so, so it's based on the natural elements of life. Um, so Taya representing water. So Taya means abalone shell. Um, spay uh, means flower in our native Somala language and reflects uh, the natural element of the earth. Um, Kalash is the Bordeaux blend, um, which is the last blend that we have, uh, and that means breathe in our native Somala language, um, so it represents the natural element of air. And then the fourth natural element that we're missing is fire, and um, so uh, we have this sparkly Roussan uh, that uh. we're making, and um, hasn't been released yet. Uh, but yes. So, but it's already that made. You just haven't. You just haven't released. Of fire. You, it's been made. You just haven't released it. We haven't released it, correct? Oh um, dang! Is there any sleeping. way? It's is, sleeping. Is yes. there any way I could get a bottle to sleep in my house? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's still capped. It's not even. Oh. We haven't even disgorged it yet. Oh my goodness! Um, That's so. exciting. So this is how do you say it? spy spay 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 means flower. Um, now you you're making me want to learn Somala. Somala, yes. Somala. So this is 
So this is a little meaty, um, meaning like more like bacon fat, um, and that's like the Syrah kind of talking here, because um, this one is really kind of gamey. Um, and I really and like how light these wines are. Like Definitely. they're so light and elegant and just beautiful. Thank you. So, so this is <clears throat> a blend of predominantly Grenache base, mm -hmm. so Grenache Syrah Carignan, so a GSC instead of like a GSA. Mm -hmm. So taking out the Moved and putting in Carignan. Carignan, yes. Carignan. So another Rome varietal. So uh, I kind of, I kind of like see myself as a purist in the sense that um, I stick to Rhones with Rhones, Bordeaux with Bordeaux, Burgundies nice. with Burgundies. I don't blend the two. Um, and I follow it with, um, you know, the bottle size as well. Um, putting it in, in, you know, Burgundy bottles, um, Bordeaux belong in Bordeaux bottles. I kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> is it, is I, can't, I can't mix a, a Cabernet Sauvignon with a Syrah. I just, I just can't do that. Is that because know. of your personality? Are you the Maybe same it's way? Me. <laughs> like when you eat your food, do you keep all your food separate? Oh, yeah. Like, I know. I know. <laughs> uh, see, like, I love casseroles. I love to just mix everything on the plate. Yeah. That's why I'd be the worst winemaker, probably. Because I'd be like, yeah. I really do. The only one I mix is my rice with, like, you know, whatever, whatever, right? But that's about it. <laughs> I love it. Keep everything separate. <laughs> this is Tara's Thanksgiving plate. Oh my god! Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I know, and mine would totally be whatever. That is the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, what was it like in when when you went to Spain? Was it your first time leaving the country or when I first when you traveled first out of the country? I mean, like when I, I traveled out of the country when I was 16 years old to Mexico, no, oh. to Spain, <laughs> to Spain. <laughs> not for, for, for wine and, or for like and what? No, I was just a kid, and um, and so and I can't even believe my parents let us go. <laughs> um, it was me, my older brother, and my two cousins. Um, we we had a foreign exchange brother who um, who lived with us for a year, mm -hmm. uh, and then so he was going back to Spain to his country, and, and we wanted to go. And, I love it. And my parents, it took some convincing, but my parents let me go with my older brother. And, and did you so, drink wine when you were in Spain at that age? Yes, I did. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> no, because you were. You I had you wine. Had I had wine, wine for so all the cocktails. Long. <laughs> all the cocktails. <laughs> Partied in Puerto Banus. <laughs> I mean, it was like the happening town, the happening little villages that are nearby. You're right along all the ports and uh, port of entries and everything. It's just, it was, it was awesome. I what mean, city were you in in Spain? Marbella. Okay, nice. Yeah, so you could actually see Africa um, from where my brother lived, like on the other side right oh there. Oh my goodness. And it, was, it, wasn't, it didn't even look like it was really that far, but you could see the tip of it, yeah. Ooh, wow, could you take a ferry over to yeah, Africa? Sure you can, yeah. Oh, wow, that's so nice. Oh, it's pretty close, yeah. Until and so, then you went again after that, so like, is that how so you So then picked? from then, I just started traveling back and forth um, to Spain um, and visiting my my foreign exchange brother and uh, are you still friends with him oh yeah he, he lives here in um he lives here in santa monica nice so he's an architect now oh, nice yeah <laughs> and so like when you went there like when you picked harvest right because you know a lot of winemakers they go to harvest they go work a harvest like spain was a natural choice for you because you had already been a couple times right yeah. and so what part of spain did you work harvest in um, so the Pyrenees Mountains of Spain. So this is Tiffany. Tiffany's our other Hi, Hi um, Tiffany. Um, tasting room associate. She's our tasting room associate. Thanks for letting us take over. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I don't want my voice recorded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, just FYI, when you come in, the recording. <laughs> She's a little shy. I love it. <laughs> So Pyrenees, is that like near where they the make Pyrenees. the... So, um, so France mm -hmm. and Spain, the border between France and Spain. Nice. 
were they making sparkling wine there, kava in those mountains, or everything? Um, it was a little bit of everything, believe mm-hmm. it or not. I mean, at least the winery that I worked at, uh, I mean, it was Pinot Noir. I mean, it was your typical Pinot, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, um, Albedino, um Syrah, Petites, Petite Oh, yeah, so they made everything. Yeah. Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, yeah. So, would you travel to any other countries to work harvest? Um, I or would do you love. Have a dream? I would love to, but I think I'm just because normally because like you have to be like a certain age. So, um, so I like to go work in Australia. I mean, like they have these programs, but you, mm-hmm. it's like until you're. 30. <laughs> oh, okay. Some of the younger, younger generations, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess you can, um, but at least the programs that I knew back then, um, they No, had. but like right now, if somebody was like, hey, I want you to be a guest winemaker at oh, my yeah. winery, which country would you choose? Probably France. Oh, okay, that's France. classic. Yeah. What part of France? Northern Bordeaux Rome. or, or Bordeaux? Oh. Northern Rome. Duh, <laughs> right? Grenache, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, that would be. But I travel every year um, back to Europe. Um, so as I mentioned, my wife is from Spain. And so um, so we go, and, and it's my vacation time that, that I take, but I, I'm still, I, I'm still um, you know, surround myself with wine. And we go and visit the just different regions um, in Spain or in You should France. come so, to South Africa. So this, so you can this come last, to the harvest. Yeah. So this, so this last one we did was in April, or no, March, and it was on Northern Rome. Nice. So, so yeah, cool climate for us. <laughs> did you learn anything when you were in Northern Rome tasting? Like, did you, did yeah, you bring just, like what what information did you bring back and say I want to add that to my wine making process? Well, it's just so traditional, so old world mm-hmm. um, style of winemaking there. I mean, it's just like, you know, there's so many differences that they have. One being the soil, uh, two being the climate. Um, but really, they don't really, um, I mean, they really just let it sit and let it kind of like really not do a whole lot to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm learning that. Kind of be patient with it and, and just let it sit there and, and let it age. And so, um, but yeah, I, and um, but like I said, it, it's just totally different. Um, you know, the vines are older, a mm-hmm. lot older. So, and the traditions. So, and the traditions, um, you know, um, as well. It's like everything's really pretty much done by hand. It's old school. So. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favorite <clears throat> varietal that you make, like one that you just love to make? Like if somebody said, you cannot make any more wine, you have to pick one varietal, one single varietal, and you have to make that for the rest of your life, what would it be? You have to. You have to just pick one. One. You just have to pick just one varietal. I would probably say, I, and it's not because I just visited Northern Rome, but, but Syrah. Only oh. because only because there's just so many ways of making a Syrah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many ways to make it. I so. love that you say that because Syrah is absolutely my favorite varietal for that reason. Right. Like, you can go from um, Central Coast and taste Syrah, and it tastes one way. It's very, you get that big plum followed by the black pepper. Or you can go to Sonoma Coast and mm-hmm. you can taste Syrah and then you get that peppery on the on the front end and then mm-hmm. you get that fruit. Mm-hmm. And it can just be so diverse no matter where you go. Right. So that's why I love Syrah. Yeah, too. no, absolutely. Um, and I think that's why for my own label, um, that's why we focus on it and we focus on the different vineyards because they're not all the same. Mm-hmm. Um, every vineyard's different. So so what's your label called and where can we get your label? Camines to Dreams is the name of it. So Camines um, is in Catalan and it means uh, path, the path that we take to our dreams. Oh my God, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> like literally, I love that yeah. name of a wine. Like I need a bottle of that in my life. Where can I get that from too? So we're, we're on F Street. <laughs> F Street? Yeah, we have our tasting room. 
on F Street, and um, I don't know if she's still she here left. or not. Yeah, she's Did over she go there. to F Street? She, she's over okay, there. Okay, right so now. I'm going to need to get that when I leave here, but I'm definitely going to yeah. get Keto Lines too, but I definitely need the path to my dreams because I feel like that's where my life is right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah, very, very fitting. It is, and it is, it's just like a dream, a dream of ours that we've always wanted to have, and it's just like, you know, taking that leap. It's the hardest part. Like, but once you make the leap, you're like all in. <laughs> you yes. have to be, oh, it's like either me. all or nothing. <laughs> Is that kind of like what you think about your life right now? Because like, come on now, Native American, growing up in California, this industry can be very white male dominated, right? And now you're like owning it. You know what I mean? You're like doing the damn thing. So sometimes you just sit back and you're just like, wow. Yeah, I I do, um, and. You know, I mean, I, I face a lot. Um, yes, being a minority, um, being Native American, um, I, I've, I've been surrounded with, you know, within my whole life. I went to a private school, um, private schooling and everything. And so um, I just learned that don't worry about what everybody else yeah. says about you. You do you. Stay and, your path. And stay on your, stay on your path and, you know, just do you <laughs> I love it and so so yeah I, I am and um <laughs> 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 I've been wanting to meet you for so long Aww. and when I talked to Iris and she was like you have to meet Tara you have to meet her yeah. and um it's just you know as women just as women in general I feel like sometimes it's hard for us to do what we want to do right. versus what we should do right? right because society says oh you should do this right. or like you should have kids at this yeah. age you should be doing this you know what right. I mean and so to get away from yeah. all the shoulds yeah exactly. and to stay on your path and live yeah. your dreams it's like it's like amazing. So whenever yeah. I meet women who are doing exactly that, I just right. get I'm sorry. No, I'm a cancer. Oh. <laughs> I can't get any emotional. It's okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I mean, going back to um, to it all. Yes, it, it is a very male-dominated industry, and and it is tough. Um, being a being a woman in wine, being a minority, <laughs> um, just in a male dominated and, and in um, American <laughs> dominated yeah. industry. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it. it um, and to have a whole tribe behind you, right? Like, yeah. and that's the thing. That's the that's one of the things. And I have that's a tribe very of women in, behind me too yeah. to to back me up. Um, but yeah, I mean, at first. Um, I, I didn't really see see much of like the prejudice in in the wine industry at first. Um, maybe because I was just blind to right. it as well. Um, but but yeah, I mean there were instances where um, you know I wanted to be a part of a tasting, but they didn't want me to be there because I'm I'm different. I'm right. I, I'm, I'm Native American. I'm a minority. They're afraid I would get all the attention, and so and my story would would prove that. And so. I, I, I wasn't asked to, to sit at the same table with them, and, and I was a little hurt by that because it's not really, it's, you, sh- you should look be beyond all of that, and, and really the message is here in the bottle. Just taste the wine. <laughs> yeah. You know? Just, you like, know, let let my the wine, wine speak for my yes. story, right? Let, let the wine speak for itself, and, and yeah, that was the hardest challenge. But now you built your own table, so like, okay, forget their table. <laughs> like, I mean, and my own no, table. No, but, but that's that's my model too. Like, it's nice to be invited to the table, and it's mm-hmm. nice to have a place for the table. It's nice for to have a little welcome card with your name on that table, mm-hmm. like everybody else. Right. But sometimes we don't necessarily get those opportunities, no. right? So then we got to. It gotta, took me a while. So now we got to build our own tables, yeah. and then when we have our own tables, they're like, "Can we come to your party?" <laughs> And we always say yes, yes but yeah, then they want to come to that table and sit at our table. Yeah, we'll put you in the high chair. <laughs> we'll give you a booster seat. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I have the same experience in the wine industry, too, you know, being an African-American right. woman. And I don't feel like a lot of times, like, there's this overt, like, racism. And I'm not going to, I mean, I try not to have a chip on my shoulder. Oh, yeah. 
but at the same time, there's things that happen, and you're just like, wait a minute, that would not have happened if I were a white. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that happens, and I mean, but I feel like no matter who you are, what what you are, you would always have challenges, right? It's just yeah. that our challenges are are different. But see, that's 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 the most fascinating part about it all is that the challenges that you face and overcoming the challenges only makes you stronger. Yes. And and so you become stronger within yourself and 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 then from there it, you're able to take on anything. I'm like a and pinot so. grape from the east side. <laughs> <laughs> a pinot grape. Oh. You know, all the challenges just no, make my skin thicker and yeah. you know, when I survive it I'm like the best of yeah. like yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um and and yeah, I had a lot of obstacles. I still do have obstacles. Um but it's just about conquering them. Mm-hmm. And then it just makes you then you feel like you're on the top of the mountain and you're like, Yay <laughs> I get it. I love it. Yeah. So well, should we move on to the to the next one here? Yes. Um, what is on? What are, are you doing your own play? Oh, or no, I'm doing yours. Oh, collage. Collage. So here is uh, the, last of, ooh, the last of the three blends. Um, so this is Merlot-based. So Merlot, Cap Sauv, Cap Franc, a little bit of Petit Verdot. You went on to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I started with that. That was your first. That was your first. That was that was your aha moment was. My first red wine was. Oh, was really What was your first wine? Oh, I don't remember. It was a white. Mine. So Mine's was Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill. No, like I and I felt like I was like she's down there trying to be bougie. No, <laughs> tell me what your first one was. <laughs> 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 I mean, it said wine on the label. Yeah, the wine coolers. Yeah, <laughs> you, you gotta start somewhere. Back in the day. And then when I when I graduated from college and I thought I was a little fancy, <laughs> it was like Sutter Home, White Zinfandel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was that the wine in the box or was that the big, it, the big? I was fancy. It was a bottle. It was oh, like the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a college graduate by then. <laughs> <laughs> My sister sent me an orange muscat from a Kwani mm. vineyard uh, up north mm-hmm. and I didn't like the way alcohol tasted at all but that was my gateway into wine and if I were to have it now I would think okay this is syrup to put on my pancake yeah but you know what though that's not that's not half bad like that's not in the same category as like Boone's Farm and like White Zinfandel <laughs> yeah. you could do that quadri like you know, after dinner with yeah. like maybe some cheese I or wasn't something. Doing it that way, <laughs> you were drinking it like a full glass. Yes. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because like I hate, I hate to really kind of say this in a sense, but but it was in high school that I was drinking wine. Like that's what kind of but started it. Were you like making judgments? Were you in high school like like, or were you just in high school like? When people were going for beer, you were like, oh, no, I have I'd go wine. for a booze. Okay. Yeah, it's weird. I know. <laughs> I mean, I should have said No, but you were well-traveled. You had went to Spain and everything. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> private school. That's a private school. <laughs> I was drinking I was drinking wine coolers We don't call that drinking. We call that communion. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, communion wine <laughs> is... I'm just saying. Real wine. Oh, yeah. We always have real wine. Yeah. But See, mine was Manischewitz. Yes. That yes. Was but it was real first. wine, though. It was that's actually wine. That's what my mom drank. So wow. And she always gave me some wine. A different cultural thing. I know. Like, right. when I was young, like in yeah. elementary yeah. school, right. I always had my own little glass of Oh, wine. I love your mom. So, yeah. Manischewitz. My, my mom drank um, Carlos Rossi. And she oh. would make... And she would make sangria, so that was the my game. experience yeah. with wine. Yeah, the ju- I remember wine coming in a jug. That was wine for me. Yep. Yeah. 
<laughs> jug of wine. Jug of it wine. was. Did we see the car? It's, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a jug of wine. My Literally. My grandmother would have the, the Chianti with the little straw. Oh, with the basket. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Your grandma, grandma was fancy. No, she wasn't. Any any favorites? Um, oh, my goodness. I mean, there wasn't really... I like the Taya. The Taya. And the Grenache yeah. was my favorite. Yeah, actually, I poured this yesterday. I poured a couple of wines yesterday, and this was the favorite. Yeah, mm-hmm. I really like that one. Um, mm-hmm. Is it possible to taste the... Um, yeah, what would you like? Do you guys want to taste the Syrah or the Cab? Yeah. Syrah. Syrah, yes. Okay, Syrah. Syrah, Syrah. I like this one. This one is the... Collage. Collage, okay. So, so just like any Bordeaux wine, um, when you open the cork, pop the cork, you need to allow it time to breathe. Mm-hmm. And so hence, collage means breathe. Breathe collage. I like the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I go back to South Africa. Um, when so are you going to South Africa? You should visit me um, in December. In December, mm-hmm. you go work harvest there, or oh, I'm gonna go live there. So oh, I live there. live there. So I live in South Africa, um, December to June, and then I live in the States June into December. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah right. and so I'm not gonna work. <laughs> I'm not gonna work harvest, but I do. You can. You should come and help out. I do this harvest boot camp with this. Um, they're young adults that I volunteer for. It's called PYDA. So we do this harvest boot camp where I pick a winery. We go out to the winery. We like pick grapes for a couple hours. Then we take a tour of the um, the cellar, and they test sugars. And then we have a barbecue, a braai hmm. at the winery. Oh, wow. For the day, because they're in this group called PYDA, and they're learning about the wine industry. It's black South Africans, so they try to train them up so they can get jobs in tasting rooms or in cellars or wherever. And then I also teach a wine tourism class, and I host, like, this seminar of um, in the tourism class where I invite professionals to come out and talk to them about, like, working in the industry. Mm -hmm. And then I do an American wine tasting, which I'm definitely going to pour your wines at my American wine tasting for them. Because, like, a lot of them would never, ever get to taste, like, Mm -hmm. wines from America because they're so expensive in South Africa. Oh, really? American wines are super expensive. So, like, an American wine is going to be, like, at least three times the price, like, retail, like, if you go to a store, not even Mm -hmm. in a restaurant. Because because of apartheid, they don't really have a program where they're importing a lot of wines, first of all. And then mm-hmm. secondly, they make a lot of wines in South Africa. So there's no reason for them to get American wines mm-hmm. because American wines are so expensive. So. Right. Wow. Yeah. So not only, they probably wouldn't taste it. So then I bring wines from like New Mexico, um, New York, like Riesling mm-hmm. from New York. I bring sparkling wine from New Mexico. And then wines from California, of course. Hmm. Southern and Northern California. Wow, awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you leave in December? I leave in December. Wow. Yeah, but I'm there. You should come for harvest. I know. Well, I wish I could. We just opened up this, uh, our own tasting room over here in, a couple months ago. And so it's just Mireille and I. So I'm just like, you know, it being a new winery tasting room where we're trying to stay open during harvest time, which is challenging because we're working mm-hmm. here, there. And well, I want to come up. Can I come up? And we're, I'll work for wine, but I can work the tasting room, entertain people, pour your <laughs> wine. Like, it literally would be so fun for me to just work there a weekend. Like, seriously, I'm going to call you and text you about kidding. that. I'm not kidding at all. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. not kidding at all. That's cool. That would be fun. So this is our 2016 Syrah. Um, and... Um, yeah, it's 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 a lot different than what you tasted in in this 14 um, spay blend because it was the Syrah that was really gaining in it. But in 2016, yeah, it's weird how the different vintages kind of. And that's what I'm talking about with Syrah. It's just mm-hmm. like it, it it could give you so many and different aspects of it. And it's funny. So if you guys think about how this spay tasted, the spay was a lot more savory of a wine. Mm-hmm. Um, it was gamey, it was savory, but then this Syrah is more fruity. 
it's like that central coast syrup. Yeah. Which but, has that, that freshness, that pepper, um, that spiciness. Um, But then towards the back of it, you kind of get more of the darker fruit characteristics and it kind of goes into that chocolate espresso um, So good. I'm always <clears throat> buying Syrah whenever I go out. Yeah. But I think I'm going to get the Syrah and the Grenache <laughs> and the Taya. Yeah. The Grenache is, is, definite, is a definite. Yeah. Grenache is definitely. Grenache even up there because we just released it. No, it's oh, wait, not just the No, I mean, that's how it's just yeah, we, yeah, we haven't had a chance to. Oh, are you guys selling it, it in there? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we're selling it. It's just, um, we just released it just so recent. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to stop the recording, but I do want to say thank you so much. Ah, you're welcome. This was an amazing experience. I love all of your wines. I can really tell that you put some thought into them and some dedication and mm. my favorite thing about the wines is how light body they were so mm. a lot of times when people think about california wines they think about these big, big fruity old, like overbearing yes, wines yeah. but yours were nice and elegant and honestly there was not one that i did not like oh, thank you so thank you so much yes of course did you want to take a quick look at the I do. production side of it